Welcome to Smash Fiction, the podcast where we pit two or more fictional characters against one another in a battle of strength or wits or the unbeatable combination of button mashing and boob physics and see who would win. I would like to point out, Miles, your knowledge of RPGs is showing in that these games don't have button mashing or boob physics, but carry on. Really? Neither? They're like RPGs. They're like tactical. You don't mash buttons. You like make choices. Final Fantasy 13, a relatively modern game, does not have boob physics at all. Is that what you're telling me? Not how you mean it. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? It's not DOA. If somebody said to you it did have it and you watched it, you would go like, oh no, this isn't boob physics. You would feel like they'd lied to you. All right, here we go. I'm going to do it again. In a battle of strength or wits or characters I don't know anything about. <laughs> yeah. And see who would win. Let's just say there's a reason there's no Final Fantasy Extreme Beach Volleyball Miles. That's right. <laughs> this week, Tara Branford versus Tifa Lockhart versus Lightning. <laughs> Sir. Says the disembodied voice, seemingly from nowhere. Surge, can you hear me? Surge, who has just finished completing the central quest of Chrono Cross, which Miles totally bothered to do research on, looks up sharply, the titular Chrono Cross in hand. Who said that, he asked, or would have, if, like so many protagonists in Japanese video games, he was able to speak out loud. <laughs> Every year, hundreds of Japanese video game protagonists <laughs> suffer from total or near total voicelessness. A symptom brought about by the tragic intention of game developers to create immersive, first-person player surrogates. These characters cannot and have never been able to speak for themselves, to laugh, to sob, to be free. Call now and lend your support to these- <clears throat> Serge looks around, <laughs> searching for the source of the voice, only briefly indulging in his jealousy of the speaker's ability to speak actual words. Suddenly, a figure shimmers into being before him, a flickering apparition dressed in dark robes and a hooded cowl that covers his or her face in shadow, as he has done throughout his life as a member of the Chrono Cross universe, which Miles totally knows stuff about, he wonders anew when exactly the acid kicked in, and if it might not have happened before he was even born. <laughs> Concern yourself not with the acid, booms the voice, now clearly coming from the robed ghost thing before him, for I have seen in my visions that you were sold some pretty weak shit. Now hear me! I am the spirit of the great prophet Matthew Laserwitz, and you are now the bearer of the Chrono Cross which Miles definitely knows many things about. <laughs> you have used this universe-shaping, timeline-manipulating MacGuffin to complete your own quest, but now you must pass it on to others in need. In my visions, I have seen three women who hail from a universe defined primarily by its thoroughly self-contradictory title. Each is in dire need of the Chrono Cross, <laughs> as they can use its nebulous abilities to restore their own worlds, each of which has been shattered and devastated by apocalypse, but only one can be the new bearer. And to determine which one it shall be, they must be taken to the Temporal Vortex, where they will battle one another for mastery of the Chrono Cross. Why, you ask? Because it pleases me! Forcing people to fight for the entertainment of the masses <laughs> is the only means by which the great Laserwits can still feel joy. <laughs> Surge doesn't really understand any of this, but it's not like he needs the Chrono Cross anymore, and he's anxious to be done with this business so he can go score some actual acid. With this in mind, he does as the Prophet Laser... <laughs> <laughs> I don't appreciate this character assassination very, of a character that I have much more I very much appreciate this character assassination of otherwise emotionless and personalityless surge from Chrono Cross. It would make sense, like, why he never speaks if he was just really high all the time. It would explain a lot of the events and storyline of Chrono Cross for sure. All right, carry on. <laughs> With this in mind, he does as the Prophet Laserwitz requests, searching the time stream for Tara Branford, Tifa Lockhart, and Lightning. After reading Surge, Surge's story on the notepads he provides them, and determining that they are not, in fact, on acid. I mean, what other explanation could there be? The three warrior women agree to his terms and accompany him to the Temporal Vortex, where they will do ferocious but non-lethal battle for the ultimate prize. Which of these fighters will win the time-displaced combat and use the Chrono Cross to restore their world? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out why Shadow over Mistara suddenly became just an apocalyptic wasteland sandbox game without any side quests or NPCs except that creepy clown dude who won't stop laughing. So I, Miles Schneiderman, will once again be your judge of all things fantastic and final this week. Representing Tara Branford is Claire Mulcairn. Tifa might be strong in FF7, 
but Tara sent her ass to final <laughs> heaven. What a tragic end to this short bout. This knockout got nice. knocked out wow. from FF13. <laughs> hailed a big dunce. Let alone twice. <laughs> Lightning couldn't strike once. All that she could do is what she does best. Brood and pout. Brood and pout. Uh, outstanding. <laughs> I don't know if that's it, but I'm going to move forward in case there's more. Representing at Heath Lockhart <laughs> is Dan Mulcairn. Mock me, and I'll squash you, <laughs> Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get grandfathered in on that one? <laughs> and representing lightning is Megan Bob. Welcome to the me round. <laughs> uh, in order to determine who goes first this week, I ran out of time to make a logical decision and just asked a Ouija board. The spirits informed me that I've been working too hard and I should really learn how to properly interpret the words of the spirits of the dead so they can give me time management advice, which I naturally interpreted to mean that Claire was going first, followed by Dan, followed by Megan Bob. I mean, what other explanation could there be? So, on that note, Claire, begin your, your argument with these words that I just made up. Y'all know about espers, right? They're called different things in different Final Fantasy games. Genju, Adalons, GFs, Aeons, whatever you call them. They're these super powerful, legendary, magical creatures like Ifrit, Odin, Shiva, Majuin, Bahamut. And usually you can only summon them as a sort of ultimate ability. And when you do, they show up, they do one powerful thing one time, and then they disappear, but it can often, like, one-shot an entire group of normal enemies. The idea being, I'm guessing, they're redonkulously powerful creatures, and you can only manifest them for a short time or else whatever. They basically have to invent various plot contrivances to keep you from being able to summon espers all the time, because if that was an option, it's all you would ever do. But I hear what you're thinking right now. Claire, why are you talking about espers? Are you supposed to be talking about Terra? Oh, I'm going to talk about Terra. Terra <laughs> is a former Magitek Knight, an elite <laughs> order of living magical super weapons that serve the evil Gastalian Empire. Another Magitek Knight you may have heard of is Smash Fiction alum Kefka. But unlike Kefka, who gained the ability to wield magic because of a dangerous experimental procedure which shattered his puny human sanity, Terra can wield magic because she's half Esper, the child of a human woman and the aforementioned Esper Majuin. And the unnatural strength of Terra's magical abilities due to her unique heritage is a recurring plot point in Final Fantasy VI. Perhaps the greatest display of magical power she unleashes is in a flashback when she's still one of the bad guys, and the Empire decides to test her abilities by making her fight against over a hundred Imperial soldiers in Hulkbuster-style Magitek power armor at once, and she annihilates them all with a single thought. Later in the game, Terra gains the ability to push her powers even further by going Super Saiyan and transforming into a full Esper for limited periods of time, which in her case means turning into a glowing naked purple lady who can fly like Superman. The first time she activates this form, she ends up flying halfway across the world, and the next plot arc of the game concerns the rest of the party trying to find her. After that, she gains the ability to summon this form at will, and while in this form, she deals double damage with her attacks and takes half damage from magic. In addition to the magic that she learns naturally, Terra can also equip a piece of Magicite, which are magical crystals that contain the spirits of dead espers. Once per battle, she can summon the esper within whichever Magicite she has equipped, and it can perform some sort of big ultimate attack. But also, as she levels up, she slowly learns magic associated with the Esper contained within, and here's the key point, if she unequips the Magicite, she retains the magic the Esper taught her, unlike certain other inferior systems of learning magic via crystal from certain other Final Fantasy games. Oh, I'll get to that. I didn't say your name, I didn't say anything, I don't know what you- <laughs> We knew what you were talking about. You and I knew what we were talking about, That's Miles. That's true. <laughs> I don't know anything about what you're talking about and haven't since you began, but continue. Great. This means that by the end of Final Fantasy VI, by swapping between different magic sites as you level up, Terra can learn every spell in the game. Both her opponents in this match are limited to a subset of the full roster of spells from their respective games, but Terra can just know all the spells all the time without having to equip certain gems at the start of a battle and without having to switch between different modes during battle. And Final Fantasy VI has some stupidly powerful top tier spells like Life 3, which unlike a normal resurrection spell, Life 3 is when you proactively cast on a living character and it auto-resurrects them the next time they would die. I could be wrong, but I have looked over the spell list from FF7 and FF13, and I can't find an equivalent spell in either of those games. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it exists. So, if you want to kill Terra, you're going to have to make her run out of MP first, because you can bet your ass she's always going to have that spell on whenever possible. Oh, and by the way, she's never going to run out of MP either, because she has another stupid broken spell called Osmos, which lets her drain MP from her opponents to recharge her own. So I assure you, Terra is most certainly not going to be the first one to run out of magical juice in this battle. And I haven't even touched on attacks yet. There's a 
ton of attack spells with different strengths and weaknesses and elemental effects attached to them, but to just pick one, eh, why be subtle? I'm trying to win this thing. Let's say Ultima. It's the strongest magical attack in the game, deals obscene amounts of non-elemental damage to all enemies at once, and ignores magic defense. Mages in other Final Fantasy games are physically weak and only capable of wielding staves as a way of balancing out their magical powers, but Terra, being a Magitek Knight, emphasis on the knight part, is no slouch when it comes to getting physical, and her preferred weapon is a sword. Now, she doesn't have any spin-off movie sequels like Tifa or, or gorgeously choreographed cutscene battles like Lightning that give her a chance to show off her skills, but if you look at her strength and speed compared to the rest of the FF6 party, most of whom are trained warriors of one sort or another, she's kinda average when it comes to strength and speed, so it's reasonable to assume that she's not just a knight in the way that Paul McCartney is a knight, and that sword of hers is not just for show. When I play Final Fantasy VI and I'm trying to conserve my party's MP, I have Terra kill plenty of giant monsters and killer robots without the assistance of magic at all. Magic is her forte, but if someone throws a punch at her or swings a gun sword at her, she can dodge, she can block, she's not gonna embarrass herself. In terms of equipment she's gonna be bringing to this fight, Final Fantasy VI has all sorts of legendary magic swords that a high-level Terra might be wielding, like the Ultima Weapon, the Ragnarok, or my personal favorite, the Lightbringer. But I won't bore you with the details, they're all stupid busted, and if she has the Genji Gloves equipped, she can even wield two at once. But the coolest piece of Terra's high-level equipment that I want to highlight is known as the Minerva Bustier. This piece of armor <laughs> makes her immune to fire, ice, wind, and even lightning. Sorry, Bob, she's immune to you. It says right here in the rulebook. <laughs> I can make this up. It also gives her resistance to earth, water, poison, and holy, and it increases her max MP and boosts her strength, speed, uh, stamina, and magic. Now that is a pretty goddamn impressive supportive garment. Lifting and supporting all her vital statistics. <laughs> I still don't know what Victoria's secret is, but Terra's secret is that she's immune to fire, ice, wind, and lightning because of her magic bra. <laughs> I know that to a modern audience of gamers, Terra can seem like a bit of a forgotten footnote in the history of Final Fantasy, but I'm here to tell you that not only does she hail from a time before 3D graphics or competent Japanese to English translation, but she also hails from a time before balanced RPG mechanics were a thing, and so Terra's just kind of broken. But don't worry, soon Tifa and Lightning are going to be broken too. Aww. Aww, I like that. Well, I certainly learned a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> Miles, what does Life 3 do? Lots of new words. <laughs> lots of new words. Lots of new concepts. I know what Life 3 does. I was, I was listening to you. <gasps> All right, it's time to move on to Tifa Lockhart from the only Final Fantasy game I've ever played. Unfortunately, Tifa wasn't the little cat dude on top of the big dude. So, Dan, I'm going to need you to tell me about her. That's all right. I got you covered, bud. In a series which leans heavily on repeated character archetypes, particularly when it comes to its female characters, Tifa Lockhart stands alone. Part of that is because she was the first female character in the series to specialize in unarmed martial arts, and the things she's able to pull off with her physical strength alone are staggering. Her stronger blows cause actual explosions which can crack metal. She can tear military-grade combat mechs apart with her bare hands, and she's easily able to suplex enemies the size of houses or larger, including enemies which are, in fact, quasi-living houses. Her feats of martial prowess are so great that, during some of her combos, dolphins will spontaneously manifest in midair to uppercut her enemies alongside her. This is not <laughs> the game taking artistic license, either. This literally happens. She punches so hard that dolphins. <laughs> of course, she's not limited just to warping reality itself with a well-timed elbow drop. In Tifa's world, magic is granted through gems called Materia. Each of these gems grants a different ability. Some Materia grant certain types of magic spells, such as fire or healing or turning enemies into harmless frogs. Some of them grant access to abilities which are normally only available to certain classes, like stealing, being able to see an enemy's weaknesses, being able to cast multiple spells at once, or being able to perfectly replicate the abilities of an enemy. Some increase Tifa's natural abilities, increasing her strength or speed or durability or magical aptitude by a huge amount. Some can be used to summon Final Fantasy's ubiquitous game-breaking elemental demigods like Shiva, Bahamut, or the Knights of the Round. Not only is Tifa by far the most physically powerful and adept of the three combatants here today, her materia give her a crazy degree of flexibility and versatility. She will always have a new trick to pull out that neither Terra nor Lightning could possibly see coming. The crazy thing is, though, that so much of her astounding physical abilities don't come from materia at all. She doesn't once use materia in the film Advent Children, and yet she's still seen as being at near Dragon Ball Z levels of strength and speed. There's the moment when Tifa, with no leverage, throws 
cloud about a mile into the air at supersonic speeds. Or earlier, when she gets ambushed by a clone of Sephiroth in a church, with no materia and no prep time, Tifa is able to beat this guy down so hard that he starts crying. I mean, Smash Bash winner Sephiroth? Well, a clone of his, but yes, that Sephiroth. So the Ben Riley to his Peter Parker. There you go, yes. The fact that Cloud Strife is the main character of FF7 instead of Tifa is a borderline war crime. But weirdly enough, it kind of works in Tifa's favor for the purposes of this match. See, one big problem that virtually all Final Fantasy protagonists share is uncertainty, self-doubt, anxiety, in short, broodiness. Tara spends a significant portion of her time and energy expressing fear over her powers, her life, her past, her future. She worries about hurting others or hurting herself. The same struggles we see other FF heroes go through, like Cloud, Squall, Tidus, Lightning. That's the one thing that sets Tifa apart. She's not the main character of FF7. She helps to support Cloud because, in the ways that matter most, she's stronger than Cloud. When Cloud is uncertain and ready to give up, Tifa is the one who reminds him what strength looks like. When Cloud is completely overcome, Tifa is the one who steps up to lead the team on their mission. And when Tifa herself is challenged, in the same ways that Cloud is, she doesn't hesitate. She doesn't brood. She stands up for herself, proving that her inner strength is greater than anyone else here today. I'm not going to say that Tifa doesn't experience doubt, uncertainty, and despair throughout her game, but unlike a certain spiky-haired overcompensator I could name, she never succumbs to these emotions, overcoming them and using them to only fuel her further, making her better. Better than she was, better than Cloud, and certainly better than Terra and Lightning. All right, I definitely remembered all of that stuff about Tifa. <laughs> I I'm assuming somebody's representing Cloud because that guy just, just got his ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, no, that was another match. All right, Megan Bob, I have no idea who or what Lightning might be, but I really look forward to hearing about her. Your Honor, you're aware that I don't come here to win. <laughs> I come here to have a good time. You know, like everyone does when they're defending fictional characters from libel. The fact that I will win this match has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the fact that Lightning is just better than Tifa and Terra. Number one, that hair. <laughs> Rose gold, wispy, Joan Jet haircut, and come on. Two, she is the little black dress of combat. She can fight anything. She's not primarily a magic user with a side order of melee fighter, nor is she a bruiser that dabbles in magic. The gameplay of 13 makes me confused and afraid. So I'm going <laughs> to put this in the simplest terms I can. So you know how the Morrigan in The Wicked and the Divine has three forms, but even when embodied in a particular form, she's still all three identities? Yes, I do know that. Okay. Megan Bob knows how to speak my language. That's all I know how to do, Miles. Lightning is always a fighter, a magic user, and also a healer. She doesn't need to control the field of battle to be effective, her varying identities change the field of battle for her. If she needs healing, she can heal herself. Enemy not in range? Well, that's what battle magic is for. It's like mailing pain to your opponents via the elements of earth, wind, fire, and Phil Collins. What if your enemy is getting too close and it doesn't look like they're just coming in for a smooch? Melee time! She also has a punishing series of quick ass-beating attacks called Army of One that she can do once the fight's been going on for a bit. It recharges, so it is not a once-per-fight situation. And what about that whole weapons thing? Lightning uses a gun blade. The shooty action of a gun combined with the classic stabbiness you've come <laughs> to expect from blades. <laughs> the weapon stats are usually a 50%, 50% balance of strength and magic, which means that whatever mode she's fighting in, the weapon is pulling its weight, except as a medic because that would be weird. Her basic weapon is the blaze fire saber, but she has other more powerful weapons with much cooler names. Flamberge, Enkindler, Helter Skelter, and Omega Weapon. The point is that even her weapon is intended specifically to make her as versatile as a Swiss army knife that can also do magic and summon Odin. Summon Odin? That's right. My darlings, buckle the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> All of our characters can summon cool shit, gods and spirits, etc. But Lightning can consistently summon the All Daddy himself. In the game, this looks rad. Odin shows up. She gets to use his sword as two even cooler swords. And then <laughs> Odin turns into Slipnir, the greatest and most legged horse in all of mythology. <laughs> and then the two of them beat the irrevocable shit out of everything. <laughs> Suck it, Misty of Chinkatig and Black Beauty. This is some next level <laughs> horse magic. 
If you want to get a feel for who Lightning is and understand what makes her tick, imagine the powerhouse soldieriness of Brienne of Tarth meets the unyielding focus and snarkiness of Arya Stark. Her parents are dead. She's raising her sister. She's a soldier turned rebel. She's got a pack of chuckle fucks for companions. Damn it, Snow! (laughs) (laughs) Man, Bob, you're two for two with the talking to Miles here between the wicked and the divine. You just need a pro wrestling reference and that's the hat trick. Yeah, if if there's a pro wrestling reference in your argument, you just win. And she's ready to destroy the government and everyone who stands in her way. In combat, once you see lightning, it's too late. The storm is here. Also, come on, guys, that hair. All right, we got a lot of stuff going on in this match, guys. It's pretty crazy. I understood about, I'm going to go with 40% of All what right. I've heard over the past 20 minutes. So in order to clarify the rest of it, let's go to rebuttals. And for those who recall, the way rebuttals work in three and four-way matches are the people, in order of their presentation of opening arguments, hosts defend their characters against attacks coming from the other, in this case, two advocates. So everybody talk some shit about terror. Claire, you had talked in your opening arguments about that very impressive scene in the flashback when Tara destroys an entire company of soldiers with magic or whatever it is. I would argue that the reason she was able to do that much magic destruction was because at the time she was wearing a slave crown, which circumvented her usual self-doubt and restraint. Presumably also that Magitek armor that she was wearing helped because we never see her do anything that purely destructive in the game after that point. I think that you're right about that as soon... I I know this is like a little bit of an old argument that we've made before on things, but like, I I do really think it's true. At the start of the game, she has no memories of who she is. That's why she has all of her doubt. That's why she can't tap into her power. But the course of the game, she levels up. She learns things about who she is. She learns how to use magic. And by the end of the game, the power level of attacks like Ultima and stuff like that is, I think, based basically on the level. It can like one shot entire huge groups of enemies and you never fight groups of hundreds of enemies. You only fight like five at a time because that's how many sprites fit on the screen. But if you ever, <laughs> but if you were to fight a bunch of magic soldiers, she could wipe the whole party with one Ultima. So I feel like at the point of the game that we're at, she's gotten back up to that level. See, the thing is we all kind of have access to, I think certainly spells of that level, you know, between the materia that I have and the spells that Lightning knows. But what the early game shows us about Terra is how she handles stress and uncertainty. You're right that she sort of overcomes her doubts about herself more or less by the end of the game. I would argue less, but when she's encountered with the unexpected or the overwhelming, she freezes up. She doubts herself. She Her reflex is to run away or cower. She may have learned to accept herself for who she is as a half esper by the end of the game, but her way of dealing with stress and uncertainty, I would argue, has not changed. I mean, I think that a clear example of, of, you, of the time you can see her changing is her fight with Humbaba, as I think the guy's name, where she, because she fights him once and she gets defeated because she's all uncertain and then she like gets all confident later and comes back and fights him again and then she's able to not in that fight she like manifests her transform and it can go the entire fight it's not on a tiber anymore she can like just be in that transform all she wants and then after that after that fight she's supposed to be like oh I'm all confident and cool for the rest of the game and like we don't really see her doubting herself that much for the rest of the game the limit breaks are called desperation attack and it allows you to do kind of a special attack I was reading about that and it was very fascinating to learn that one of the things that makes you powerful is that ability that once you are in danger and you're going to definitely be in danger in this match whenever that happens every character has the ability to do or most of the characters have this ability to then do a special attack but in FF6 for some reason it is a 1 in 16 chance that you will get to do the attack at all once you get low you're fucked I'll admit that I don't think the desperation attacks are one of the stronger elements. I didn't mention my opening argument because I don't think they're that impressive. It's just like a thing she does sometimes, but I thought her other abilities were more impressive. I will point out her attack though, Riot Blade, is like a sword-based attack and it's stronger than the desperation of Sabin or Cyan, who are respectively a martial artist guy who can like suplex a train and a super cool like magic samurai dude. And hers does more damage. I think that just more so that she's a good swordsman and she might do that attack sometimes. And if not, that's fine. Like I said, I didn't mention it. I don't think she needs it. She has the transform. She has her magicite. She has a bunch of powerful spells. How many dolphins can she summon by punching? That's what I want to know. She doesn't need to summon things by punching. She could make them with magic. You mentioned that whenever she's in her Sailor Moon form, what is it? I said Super Saiyan, which was a which was a DBZ reference, but yeah. Yeah, Sailor Moon form. This is adjacent properties. So whenever she's in that, she can't take regular damage, but she can take half damage for magic. I have magic. That's fine. You'll feel half my wrath, and then once you're out of that form, you'll feel the rest of it. 
All right, moving on to Tifa. Everybody, attack Dan. You've made a lot about the fact that Tifa is a great decision maker and she thinks clearly and she doesn't have all that self-doubt. My dude, why is she hanging out with Cloud then? That's all I gotta ask. I mean, you're hanging out with snow, so maybe don't start throwing those rocks, Miss Glasshouse. Hanging out with? No, 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 no. Like, am followed by... Cloud is this childhood friend of Tifa's. She's compassionate. She cares about him. She genuinely wants what's best for him. The fact that he tends to make bad decisions and Tifa is strong enough and compassionate enough to stand by him and try to help him is just a show of how strong she is. I really think you oversold one of the fight scenes in Advent Children. She's not fighting a clone of Sephiroth and what you think that means. She, it's a really shitty clone of Sephiroth. It's a third of Sephiroth. He has these three- <laughs> Which one is it? Laws? L-O-Z or however his name is I think it's pronounced Lowe's. Lowe's, okay. Improving home improvement. Yep. When he's not improving home improvement, he's fighting Tifa. And um, he has like one third of the F essence of Sephiroth. Who I will point out destroys the solar system as a side effect of his attacks. So, you know. That's fine. Maybe Lowe's can destroy like Mercury through Earth accidentally. But these three people are like real chuckle fucks. So I, I get the feeling that there's more of like a sum of the parts is greater than the whatever. But anyway, you're right that she defeats him in the initial fight and he like seems to be knocked out. But then what happens? He gets back up and he beats Tifa and he takes away the girl that she was protecting. She wins the fight, but then he gets back up and defeats her and she fails at her objective. I will point out that when it's just the two of them fighting with their fighting skills, she beats him. When he beats her is when he starts using magic. We see his form blur and he hits her with superhuman strength. In that fight, Tifa has zero materia on her. You can look at her gloves. She has none in her gloves or on her armor. She's going to have magic in this fight, so she has the physical attributes to duel a demigod hand to hand. The only reason she loses is because she doesn't have access to all of the things which she does have access to in this fight. If we're talking about demi whatever's demi espers, guess what? Terras have esper and I know like you have your magic, but I a lot of your arguments like you can punch and make a dolphin. It's like, I don't doubt that that's very impressive for somebody who doesn't naturally have magic. You're like in your weight class, like it's really impressive in terms of like fighting normal people, but Tifa's not up to the level of other people that have more powers. I disagree because you look at Terra's Magicite, which only gives her the ability to summon a given Esper once per battle, and like Lightning has to spend a good portion of the battle gaining technical points before she can summon Odin, but Tifa can keep calling in Bahamut and the Knights of the Round and any number of other summons that she has the Materia for, as long as she has the MP to do so. And there's the MP Absorb Support Materia, which lets her steal MP from enemies by punching them. So she can keep this summon train rolling while at the same time hindering the magical abilities of Terra and Lightning. There's a lot of things she could have. She could have this materia. She could have this one. What you have to realize is that she's only going to get a few of these things. Which ones she gets? Like if she get, if she has these summons, she can't get this other thing. Like Terra has all of her things all the time. Terra's going to have Osmos. You might have the ability to steal MP from people. Terra will have the ability. She will have Osmos. Let's underline exactly how much we're talking about here. Because if we're talking about these characters at the height of their power, which is the assumption we're making going into this, that means that Tifa has 16 materia slots. That is 16 distinct abilities that she can pick and choose based on what combination she thinks is going to be the best. That still gives her a tremendous amount of power, versatility, and flexibility on top of the fact that she's by herself a superhumanly strong and good fighter. All right, Mulcairns, team up on Megan Bob. So it takes a little bit for Lightning to do the paradigm shift thing, right? It's not like an instant transition. And I really think you're underselling how much she has to commit to a role and how much her other abilities are not there. I don't think you can attack in medic mode. She has to like switch and then just heal herself for a while and then switch back if she wants to attack. It's not like attack, 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 spell, attack, attack, whatever. I believe she also has some defensive abilities whenever she is being a medic. So she's not defenseless while she's doing it. She's just not also actively attacking. But she does have the ability to do these things equally well so she's not having to lean on one or the other of them. The thing I want to say about Lightning is I feel like she just doesn't deal with feelings of frustration especially well. Like when she goes off the handle and slaps Fang without hearing her side of the story first or the many, many times when she starts punching Snow. Those are great. Hey, I get it, man. I'm just saying these aren't signs of her being martially adept. 
those are signs of her lacking self-control when her emotions get the better of her. Because she knows it's a bad idea to do that. And so what that tells me is she's going to be easily manipulated into making a really stupid mistake just based on her emotions. Those are during social encounters. Those aren't really during fights. So I guess if she has to go on a road trip with you guys, I can see this turning into like a very punchy affair. But if it's already a punchy affair, then surely the more punching the better. If you look at Lightning's stats, she's just kind of like, meh. She's kind of like, not that great at anything. And that's fine. But when you're fighting other people, you want to be really good at fighting or really good at magic because it's not like being like kind of good at both really helps you that much. You'd rather just be really good at one because then you could just do that and kill people. But if you have kind of shitty magic and kind of shitty fighting, fighting not as good as Tifa, magic not as good as Terra, then you're not going to be dealing as much damage as either because Terra's going to be using magic and Tifa's going to be fighting. I think this does play into the fact that this is a three-way combat situation. I don't know that either Tifa or Terra is going to be paying enough attention to lightning. I really think that you're going to think the other is the big hitter and ignore lightning. Ah, the Dr. Fossilier defense. The way that you guys went at it, I, I'm i not hearing anything that proves me wrong on that count. For the record, nor am I. Well, well, one, your hair makes you very visible. My character, to be fair, does have green hair and is sometimes a giant glowing purple <laughs> woman, but sometimes you're riding Odin's horse, slash Odin. So that's pretty conspicuous. Whenever I'm at my most conspicuous, whenever I'm at my most writing slip near, I can't take any damage. If we want to talk about somebody who's going to like slide under the radar, it's going to be the one that everybody thinks died, by which they mean she actually died because they like punched a dolphin through her torso or, or like she got run over by Slepnir and died. And they're like, cool, we killed Terra. Let's go and fight each other some more. And then Terra's still totally alive because she cast life on herself and she's going to like be hanging out in the corner. That's the person who's going to be in the background, not the person with like pink hair and a gun sword. Man, she's so cool though. Well, the fighting has indeed been furious, and all three combatants are poised to leap simultaneously into one last battle, which will surely determine the winner, when suddenly, a cloud passes over the makeshift arena. A cloud, and nothing else. That's right, thought it was a little unfair to include a character named Lightning in the lightning round, so this week, prepare for the cloud round! <laughs> oh no, the Mopius round! <laughs> When the cloud disperses, the battlefield has changed dramatically. The characters now find themselves in a large rectangular room made of wood, and they are surrounded by giant-sized versions of generic home office items. For no particular reason, the truth dawns on them. They have been suddenly reduced in size and deposited in somebody's junk drawer. I mean, what other explanation could there be? Er, sorry about that, booms the voice of the Prophet Laserwitz. It's the Chrono Cross Universe mechanics, you see. They just do this sometimes. I know, because the great Laserwitz knows so much about how Chrono Cross works. Ask me no further questions. Shrinking pleases me! Now, in a few minutes, you will all be unshrunk and returned to the battlefield. However, to maintain balance or something, one of the objects you see before you will return with you, grown to an enormous size. Choose something here to use as a weapon in its giant form and continue the fight. Continue the fight! <laughs> the voice fades away. So, in the cloud round, you get to choose a random item from this junk drawer and turn it into a personalized weapon that you will wield after it grows to disproportionately enormous size. Wow. Yeah. You can choose from the following objects. A paper clip with plastic sheathing, color may vary, an old key that leads to an unknown location, a binder clip, a broken shoelace, an abandoned pen cap, slightly chewed, Ooh. or a penny. Tell me which of these objects you're picking, how you will personalize it to your character, and why it will help you win this match. Now, because the order in the main round was Claire, then Dan, then Megan Bob, Megan Bob will be going first in the cloud round, followed by Dan, followed by Claire, and that is also the order in which the contestants will choose their weapons. So, Bob. I could be more strategic about this, but why? You know? <laughs> why? <laughs> okay, she's choosing the penny. One. Style. Kind of has that rose gold coloring. Gonna go real go with her hair. Nice. Cannot overlook that. Two, if you have looked at her outfit, okay, one, she has a bunch of extra outfits in the other games. She has quite a few in the first one, but then she has a billion. But her regular outfit looks kind of Captain America-esque. I feel like she's going to get a piece of half-chewed gum and, you know, have a Captain America shield situation. Oh, shit. I mean, this is going to be a big, heavy penny. And I mean, probably can't get through that with whatever you got. Whose image will be engraved on the penny? <laughs> I guess probably Sarah, because, you know, she's fighting for a little sister. 
sister because she wasn't a great big sister. So she's probably going to carve that in with the gun blade. But also she's going to take the edges of that penny and she's going to sharpen the shit out of them. And they are going to be deadly penny edges. And then so she's just going to do that Captain America, like spin it around and chop y'all up. Fair enough. Dan, you're up next. Tifa is going to go with the binder clip. Okay. When Tifa returns to normal size, the binder clip has grown proportionately along with her. She's going to break it in half and use each half as a shield, but it still has that little kind of flippy metal bit. Right. <laughs> which I don't, I'm I'm sorry to say I don't know the official term <laughs> for. It seems like the sort of thing that I should probably learn. By the way, Dan, they're, they're not proportionate to her. They're greater. They're in greater proportions. Oh, that's fine. She can, she can certainly wield gigantic weapons. Okay. With <laughs> relative ease. Just making sure. Just like when the Hulk sticks his hand into a car and like makes some gloves out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, that's exactly right. So she can use them as a shield. She can use them for added weight and momentum to her blows. And then that little metal flippy thing on the binder <laughs> clip that kind of looks like a paper clip, but it's not. And I don't know what it's called. That thing can actually flip down after she's punched someone as a way of like giving them an additional little smack or like locking them in close to her so they can't escape and she can just keep pounding on them. Mm. Uh, and she can also flip it down prematurely and sort of use it like a punch daggers, you know, like for additional length and stabbing ability. So clearly, this is the Ultima binder clip. All right, Claire, you're up. Tara is, of course, going to pick the key. Mm. So she takes it out and is like, oh, of course, this is just some ordinary key. There's nothing special about this key. But then- I mean, it's a big key. I, I know. It's a very big <laughs> key. Because she discovers that's not a normal key. You see, Matthew Lazarus didn't know what he had when he put it in his drunk drawer. <sighs> Claire. <laughs> but it was a keyblade. Yeah, I know. And if my character had been using a sword, I would have taken the keyblade too. Oh, it's so good. What's what's a keyblade? Is that like a thing in Final Fantasy? It's a thing in Kingdom Hearts. Oh. Which is the um Final Fantasy Disney crossover game series. Okay. And the keyblade lets you open up gateways to other worlds and likes and seal them. And it lets you channel all sorts of crazy magical powers. And yeah, maybe she's gonna, you know, open up some portals to some Disney worlds, and maybe we'll see if uh if the uh, the genie from Aladdin or Chicken Little or one of the other sudden <laughs> creatures from Disney are going to show up. I mean, I would think that Stitch is the, uh, the obvious choice. Stitch is the <laughs> obvious choice of a Disney character to summon via the power of the Keyblade. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming with me on this journey to the junk drawer. <laughs> this was sort of a, a lightning round concept pulled right out of it. So it smacked a little bit of Miles sitting in his office looking around being like, what can I do for the lightning round? <laughs> Well, that was awesome, guys. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go try and figure out who won this thing and also what Materia is. I don't... Anyway. <laughs> so uh, talk amongst yourselves until I return with a just, like, fucking huge decision, guys. It's going to be like, it goes up into the sky. It's so big. <laughs> What do we think we can keep doing Final Fantasy matches? <laughs> I did not know that the two of you were going to fight like that. Yeah. Well, come on. We, we've both spent a lifetime being fairly passionate and opinionated about this series. Yeah. It sounded like a well-worn argument. You'd lovingly gotten it out like the good China, and it was a thing that you're like, oh, we get this out every holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, Bob, I feel very bad for you because I was reading, nice. I had never played Final Fantasy 13. I like watched somebody play a little bit of it one time and I, I watched some videos and I read some articles and I cannot understand what the hell is going on in that game. <laughs> like I cannot, it slides off my brain. Yep. And like, did you understand seven and six more or were they all just like nonsense to you? Is this what it's, is it because I didn't play the game or is it, or is, is 13 especially nonsense? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so I thought, because I have a concussion, that it was me, I, which Aww. was a fair assumption. It's clearly not. I will let you know. Well, I was reading this stuff for 13, and I was like, Purge, all right, what the fuck's that? And then I was like, okay, this edge train, what the fuck is that? There's a lot of proper nouns you gotta learn. <laughs> there were so You guys couldn't many. keep track of all the pulseless Cs out there? Come on. I still don't know what that is, and I've learned it like three times. Yeah, it was that, and then I learned the other ones and was like, okay, that that makes a substantial amount more sense. It is still impenetrable to me, but at the least... I can glean the shape of it. Whereas FF13 was just like, it's real pretty. That's all I can understand about it. These character designs are fascinating. But six and seven were like a little easier to understand. 
Oh, for sure. Neil has played Seven a lot. So he was kind of able to go, okay, here, let me fill you in and all this. And he told me about all the side quests. There is a really good sequence where uh, where Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa take turns threatening this one dude's testicles, which is pretty good. It's pretty good. How many, th- how long can they spend on that? I mean, they just sort of talk about different ways they're going to destroy his testicles. So, you know, it's not a long scene, but it's it's long enough. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a portion of a scene. It's, it's a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, FF7 was interesting because I feel like that was the series really trying to push for a more mature look and themes. Yeah. It's a, it's a little like 90s comics. It's like a little bit like oh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the whole cyberpunk look. That whole game I feel like was them very purposefully and consciously trying to go in a different direction because they weren't making games with Nintendo anymore. They were doing their first 3D game. They really wanted to like attract a new type of audience. 7 is a, a very revolutionary game. For for that reason, because they were really just going for very different things in that game. It was weird to to learn about six and then to learn about seven. And be like, what? What? These <laughs> yeah. seem like such profoundly different ethos going into it about like what they care about. Because six sounds like really a traditional fantasy novel. It's really like a YA novel about like Terra. Yeah, she's like totally. a little special magical girl with no memory, and like there's an evil empire. It's sort of like Harry Potter meets Hunger Games. <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's very Star. Wars or that too yeah oh yeah like huge chunks of the plot are just ripped off of Star Wars like I mean there's two characters named Biggs and Wedge in that game I have to say, I did not know what Kefka looked like until I until I did that. I Googled <laughs> it. Was I was like, he's scary, but I can see kind of the the evolution where we get to Sephiroth from that design. Oh, here's a sort of scary but also unsettlingly handsome version of this thing that is very unsettling and not okay. Well, I feel like the the scary part about Kefka is just his behavior because he's he's. I mean, such, not the clown makeup. He, he's such an unrepentant psychopath. Yeah. He he's like if the Joker could use magic, basically. Oh god. I have to ask, so did you get FF6 around the time that it came out? Uh pretty close too. That was actually pr- that was the first Final Fantasy game I ever played. Right. And our second RPG after Super Mario RPG. <laughs> yeah, the second RPG we ever played. Yeah, it was uh shortly after we got our Super Nintendo and we were just on a giant RPG kick after having played Super Mario RPG and so I had heard Final Fantasy, so I found well it was called Final Fantasy 3 in the states because of weird localization stuff, <laughs> but it was Final Fantasy VI. So yeah, that was the first one I ever played, and it was, I mean, it's still my favorite Final Fantasy game to this day. Yeah, mine too. Did it look revolutionary to you? Was it like, oh my god, I can't believe anything looks like this? It wasn't the graphics that impressed me, it was the cinematic storytelling that impressed me. Like, there's a scene where the heroes are in this castle and Kefka's attacking, the heroes go out onto a balcony, and then jump onto a bunch of chocobos that are running beneath them. And up until that point, I had never conceived a video games being able to replicate a scene like I would see in a movie. It was 16-bit graphics, you know, like it, it didn't look realistic at all, but just like the fact that they were willing to tell that kind of story with that level of technology was something I had never seen before in any video game. Yeah. Thank you for telling me that. All right. Well, I'm back. Hi, Miles. Hi, Miles. Hi. So this was an interesting match to judge. Go on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it was difficult because I was hearing a lot of good arguments from people, but unlike a lot of matches where it's like, oh, you kind of go back and forth, oh, so-and-so should win, oh, so-and-so's got this, oh, no, the next character came up. There was one character that I felt coming out of openings had an advantage in terms of what I had heard so far. And so I was kind of waiting to see if rebuttals would alter my opinion of that character's chances of victory. And in large part, while they came close, they really didn't. I kind of, there, there wasn't quite enough there. So I have to go with the character that I originally gave the advantage to, and which I think will win this fight, and that is Terra. Yeah! <sighs> yeah! I mean, you're right. But it still makes me mad. (laughs) You know, I was waiting in rebuttals for some counters to a lot of the stuff Claire was saying. You know, there was a really heavy emphasis on Terra's personality as it relates to her powers, but also just as it relates to her as a fighter in general. And in addition to Claire's, you know, well thought out response to that, I don't think the personality argument in this case, given that all characters involved here should have enough motivation to try and win this fight, I don't think it was strong enough to overcome what I perceived as 
has a pretty tremendous advantage in magical ability and magical versatility coming out of Terra, and I think that Claire managed to convince me that she was a good enough hand-to-hand fighter that the magic edge was going to be the the one to take it. So, good job by everybody, but great win for uh, Terra Brantford in this one. Thank you. Excellently done, Claire. Yeah. Megan Bob, you were great. You really, <laughs> really were. Like, I know you were coming in more blind than usual on this, but you clearly did your homework and you represented lightning quite well. Yeah. Oh, man. Sharon, please don't kill me. (laughs) (laughs) Sharon loves uh, lightning to the extent that she loves Final Fantasy. Yeah. She's pretty cool. Uh, I believe we have some kit things to do. (gasps) That's right. Oh, do we? I mean, that's up to you, man. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard the song yet, so who knows? Do we sing this song and it attracts kit? (laughs) <laughs> or is there, like, some other means of luring Kit back to the show? Yeah, I want to hear all y'all sing the song. Well, I was going to say, maybe we could all do it together. Like, one of us says time. I was going to do, it is now time for the Kit It Thanks. Ah, uh, pretty good. There you go. I did it. <laughs> like a chocobo, I come running. <laughs> Such a good burp. Anyway, you know who else are really good burps? Claire and Miles. They're actually very, very good burps. They were on the uh, Geek Wars podcast. Oh, yeah. Word, mm-hmm. yeah. Which was super fucking funny fun to listen to. Geek Wars is basically a geek trivia show and it's really well produced. I was really impressed by like all the sound effects and just, yeah, good show. Claire and Miles are hilarious and so are the two people from Detention the Dragons that they went up against. Do y'all have, do y'all have any comments? <laughs> it's like a, a a multiple round tournament thing. Maybe we get wiped out in the first round and then you stop listening or maybe we win and we move on to the next round. We're not allowed to say. Yeah, gotta listen to find out. Find out. It's a very good episode to listen to. They they all represent themselves quite well. And I will say that the other episodes of Geek Wars are also very enjoyable to listen to. Yes, the first season was super fun. It's, it's all real good, yeah. Listen yeah, listen to the whole thing. Um, we're episode five, but like, it's all great. So listen to all of it. Especially episode five of season two, we should say. Oh yeah, episode five, season two, yep. If you're really into hearing me get completely and utterly backstabbed by my own hubris, <laughs> go check yeah. out episode five of Geek War. The episode is called The Elusive. Of Bidoof, I believe. Yes. And I may have been fucking screaming at my phone during all the Pokemon stuff. So there you go. <laughs> I biff it hard on some Pokemon questions. <laughs> <laughs> Dan can attest, I walked out of Kit the bedroom. came running out of the bedroom. <laughs> just like, I, I was in the middle of something and she was like, no, that can wait. <laughs> I have to <laughs> rant about this. Anyway, <laughs> Over to Twitter. Thank you to Neil Butler, Andrew Young, Raphael Medina, The Politipop Podcast, Florian, Sean Boyd, Sandwich Surplus, Meowing Lee, Hayden, Jeff Rick Present, Matias Tatimez, Robert Ramsey, and Donald Keister for uh, just talking about our show. We had a, a lot of people loving that league, that last league that came out. Yeah. It was a good one. And on Tumblr, thank you to Fat Blunt 69. Fat Blunt 69. <laughs> Sid Rabbit Blog, G Prime, Meowing Lee, and Secretly a Skeleton. Shh. <laughs> oh, the skeleton's back. <laughs> where, where? Who's a skeleton? I mean, you don't know. It's a there's secret. A, it's an ugly rumor that there's a skeleton that listens to this show. I don't show. believe it. I don't know. I've, I don't know. I've tried to to keep the the skeleton in my closet of the fact that there is a skeleton. But uh... <laughs> over to Facebook, thank you to Tom Gro, Hayden Reynolds, Robert Ramsey, and Matias Tatimez. I think there are more people who shared, but Facebook won't let me see all the people who share a post if it happens too quickly because fucking stupid Facebook. Anyway, thank you to everyone who shares our stuff. We really appreciate it. We need you to get the word out about us. Yeah. We also really appreciate our patrons, specifically this week, Matthew Laserwitz, the uh, (laughs) trans-dimensional prophet who definitely knows a lot about the Chrono Cross. Don't don't even front. He knows tons and tons. I'm actually very curious to know how much Matthew Laserwitz actually knows about (laughs) Chrono Cross and how well I represented him in this match. Yes, but the reason that Matthew Laserwitz uh, received such representation, positive or negative, was because he is a patron of ours over at patreon.com. Uh, he kicked us a little bit of money every month, so he gets all sorts of rewards, one of which being being worked into our storyline. And other people we are thankful for are the people who review us on iTunes. Yeah. On the last uh, Smash Metafiction, the Surprise Party episode, I alluded to the fact that there were several new uh, international reviews that had come in that I hadn't immediately caught. So I read one last time, and I will be reading one this time. This one comes to us from the UK from Ooh. Chris Lynch 90. Oh. Who gives us five stars with a review titled leaves all other debate podcasts in the dust. 
And the review goes, Sure, there are a lot of debate podcasts out there, but they're semi-debates. They're quasi-debates. They're the margarine of debates. They're the Diet Coke of debates. Just one calorie, not debating enough. Does your debate podcast have a massive monthly crossover actual play RPG podcast or pit a cartoon teenager and a 60s advertising agent in a battle over perfume? Hell no, it doesn't. <laughs> God, no. Let this podcast into your life and let it stay there. Aww. So. Oh, that's Aww. very nice. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's cringe. Pretty sure it is, yes. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you to Chris and to thank everyone who reviews you. us. It helps and it warms the very cockles of our hearts. It does. Just wanted to say real quick that anyone who is a patron of ours now has access to uh, the most recent Patreon bonus content, which uh, yeah. features myself and Claire talking about Claire's favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus I can't. It's so good. We talked about Sucker Punch, and it's a lot of fun. And if you're a patron, go listen to it. And if you're not, hate, you might want to become I a patron that for movie this. so much. I hate it. <laughs> it makes me so sad. I can't. I can't handle that fucking movie. <laughs> See what you're hearing right now? That's basically a lot of the bonus content. It's, very, so good. Good. it's yeah. very, very good. It's very good. It's not just that. Though. It's like a, we do a really deep analysis, and like we debate and discuss that movie and a lot of different aspects of it from a lot of different ways and it's it's exhausting for me because I <laughs> hate that movie so much Miles does an admirable job of defending it I still think he's completely wrong I think the movie has <laughs> no fine. merit it's garbage I think he's trying way too hard you know what listen to the episode and judge for yourself we try hard for things we love Claire yeah there's there are other movies Miles there's a lot of good <laughs> movies you could it's not my favorite movie I love that theory that Miles loves it because he's not seen other films. <laughs> I will also say that if you are listening to this on or around the day that this comes out, there's still a couple of weeks before the beginning of August, which uh, those long-term fans will know, is when we do our yearly anniversary show. So if you have any questions for us that you would like for us to address or just things that you would like for us to talk about on that show, get them in via any of our usual channels. You know, email works fine, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Uh, we're going to collate those and we will talk about those in a couple of weeks. So look forward to that. Uh, ask us whatever actual, like, real questions you want to ask us about anything. Or ask us real dumb questions. We don't give a fuck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole <laughs> toast thing is like our legacy now. Sure is. And you can email your questions to us or tweet them at us or send them to us on Facebook, especially if you're in the Smash Fiction and Fan Faction on Facebook. So come hang out with us. If you are sending us a question specifically for the show, uh, please label it as such, just so there's no confusion. Yes, and it's like an anniversary question or whatever. And if I could spend just a couple more minutes here on Plug Corner, I, I, I wrote a thing, and uh, <laughs> it was published uh, on a well-established and respected website. I, I haven't written uh, a journalism piece in a while, but there's a new one up on yesmagazine.org. You may be able to find it on their main page, or you might have to, to Google it or like look for it, because it's been a, you know, by the time this comes out, it will have been a few weeks since it was published. But it is about technology and the organizations, specifically the Center for Humane Technology, that are working toward educating people about the fact that your smartphone, tablet, all that kind of tech is deliberately designed to be addictive um, mm. for a profit. And these people are attempting to educate people as to that and to essentially um, work together to try and get tech companies to be a little bit more responsible with their tech design and their product design, be a little bit more transparent about what it is that they're doing so that people can determine for themselves where this technology should go and what it should be primarily used for that's not necessarily making a profit for huge companies. So I wrote that. It's up on yesmagazine.org. Check yeah. it out. What's the name of the article, did you say? The name of the article is The People Behind Your Tech Addiction Are Now Trying to Curb It. So because the Center for Humane Technology is made up primarily of former tech industry insiders. I will be reading that article post-haste. Yeah. I hope so. I'm, I ho hope you like it. Hope you like it. It was my first journalism effort in a while and it didn't all go as planned in terms of the interviews I was or wasn't able to get, but I still think it turned into a pretty solid piece. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, go check it out and hopefully there will be more to follow at some point as I continue yeah. trying to make some sort of living at doing what I do. Miles, you're a pretty solid piece. Oh, well, thank Aww. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> tell, tell my wife you said that. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Smash Fiction. Next week, ooh, it's back. The second episode of Shipwrecked. Smash 
Smash Fiction is produced by Megan Bob, with logo designed by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. I've missed you guys. I know. I've missed you guys, too. It's good getting the band relatively back together. (laughs) You know what? Thank God we're recording, because now we have proof that Miles does love us. Absolutely. It'll hold up in court. I have never changed my position on that, aside from the myriad times I've said I hate you. Enemy not in range? Well, that's what battle magic is for. It's like mailing pain to your opponents via the elements of Earth, Wind, Fire, and Phil Collins. Please tell me he was in Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? Pretty sure he was. No. I, I think God that's damn no. It. I think Who he the was. Fuck was but he? I, he was in Genesis, right? What is this yeah, well, then? Okay, fine. You know what? I'm leaving. I it. like the element of Phil Collins though. That's <laughs> very good. He represents lightning, you know. Sure. For some reason. <laughs> that's okay. Tifa knows Phil Collins' ga. <laughs> You know, I had a moment of thinking I was going to take the key, but it's going to be the key to both of your hearts. Aww. <laughs>